I'm Matt Lyon, and this is how to use ultrasound for the evaluation of abdominal aortic aneurysms. Abdominal aortic aneurysms are important to know about because they're a common disease. Up to 5 to 9 percent of the population greater than 65 years of age are affected by the disease. Now there's three main types of aortic aneurysms. The important thing to know here is, is that what distinguishes an aneurysm versus say a dissection of the aorta is that in an aneurysm the diameter or the caliber of the vessel is dilated. This is really important. So what we're looking for in corner care ultrasound is a dilation of the aorta. Now point of care ultrasound is bedside technology so we're wanting to do this, we're wanting to screen for this disease right at the patient's bedside, right where we're taking care of them. So this is an important screening exam to know about because you can do this ultrasound exam right in the office setting and see if the aorta is a normal size or an abnormal size. And if it's an abnormal size, then we have to figure out is it an aneurysm and is it something that needs to be taken care of. The rest of this lecture we're going to talk about how to integrate ultrasound into this bedside practice for screening for abdominal aortic aneurysms. Now the reason why this is important is, is that an aneurysm, because it's a dilation of the diameter, it is at risk for rupture. And if you can imagine that if you rupture your main artery in your body, you would lose your entire blood volume in you know, seconds to a couple of minutes. So if an aneurysm ruptures, the mortality is extremely high well over 90 percent. So this brings in the 50-50 rule which is an important concept to remember. 50 percent of patients die if their aneurysm ruptures before they even reach the hospital which means that they can't have any chance of being saved. And of those that make it to the hospital with a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm only 50 percent make it then. So it's really important to diagnose this early on so that you can treat this condition before it ruptures. So rapid diagnosis and disposition is critical and that means that screening, potentially bedside screening, is an important component of management of this disease. Now why do we use ultrasound? Well this comes back to the 20-25 rule, that's what I call it. So less than 25 percent of the patients know they have the illness, which means that most of the people that have this disease don't even have any idea that they have it. And then only 25% of the people that have a ruptured aneurysm, so they're about to die, only 25% with the classic triad you learn in medicine, which is hypotension, back pain, and a pulsatile abdominal mass. Most of the time, not all of those, most of the time, all of those are not present. So if you just use your physical exam skills, your clinical history skills alone, you will miss a ruptured AAA or abdominal aortic aneurysm 30 to 60 percent of the time when it's ruptured. This is really important. So 20-25 rule is kind of the basis of why we do this. Now most patients will complain of abdominal pain and back pain is also a common component. But the physical signs of shock you know, they're not always present even when it's ruptured. Um, certainly if you're stalk, talking about detection of non-ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms, there's very little signs. As you know, the aorta is retroperitoneal, so if you try and palpate the size of this um, structure, it is very difficult to get an accurate measurement with your hands. So most people go undetected because they don't have the appropriate imaging for diagnosis. Now ultrasound is highly sensitive so you have seen how we can image the aorta very easily, we can measure it very accurately, therefore if all we're looking for is a dilation in the normal caliber then we will be able to find this very easily, this dilation, and then we'll have to figure out what we need to do with it. Now if a patient comes into the, let's say the emergency department and they have symptoms so they're hypotensive or they've got abdominal pain or they've got both and you detect a dilated aorta, you should assume that it's a ruptured AAA, which means times of the essence. And so you can look at this study here done in emergency medicine. Time to the OR if you use ultrasound versus you don't use ultrasound is dramatically less if you use ultrasound because it's so much better than your physical exam skills in diagnosing that dilation. 
So again, let's talk about what defines a AAA. This gets confused sometimes with dissection again. So a abdominal aortic aneurysm is a focal dilation of the abdominal aorta more than 50% of its normal caliber. So what is the normal caliber of the aorta? Well, the aorta gets smaller as it goes from the heart down to the bifurcation of the iliac arteries. But a general rule of thumb is about 2 centimeters. So an aneurysm is anything greater than 3 centimeters in diameter. Now, this leads to some clinical confusion, particularly among clinicians, because most people in their mind remember the number 5.5 centimeters. And the reason is, is because of this chart here, which shows the risk of rupture dramatically increases at about 5.5 centimeters in diameter. In other words, if you're trying to remember numbers, you remember 5.5 because that's when this disease becomes deadly. However, we're trying to find this disease before the risk of rupture really starts going up dramatically. So anything greater than three would be technically an abdominal aortic aneurysm, even though it's not until 5.5 centimeters or so until the risk of rupture goes up greatly. Now here's a couple of facts to remember about ruptured AAAs. 80% of them that make it to the hospital are a retroperitoneal rupture. Remember that the aorta is a retroperitoneal structure. If the aorta ruptured into the abdomen, then you would have nothing, you would have no com compression to help keep the blood into the vessel, and it would spill out into the abdominal compartment and you would die immediately. If it ruptures retroperitoneal, which is where the aorta is located, then you have that thick peritoneum that can help hold or tamponade the blood in the artery, which then keeps your cardiac output up and your perfusion up and allows it you time to get to the hospital. So most of the ruptures that make it to the hospital are retroperitoneal in nature. Those that rupture intraperitoneally, again, they die almost immediately. Now, when we're talking about ruptured AAAs, it's important for me to say one more time that if you have a patient with a dilated aorta and they come to your office, to your ER, to wherever you're working, and they have symptoms of a ruptured AAA, abdominal pain, back pain, hypotension, syncope, weakness, you should assume immediately that it's ruptured because ultrasound cannot detect the rupture retroperitoneally. We've talked about this in the FAST exam, that the FAST exam does not pick up retroperitoneal blood. It picks up intra-abdominal, free intra-abdominal fluid, in this case blood, by detecting the fluid between the organs. But retroperitoneal, in the retroperitoneal space, the aorta, there's, there's no place for the blood to collect where we can visualize it. So the FAST exam does not pick up that the bleeding. So you must clinically suspect, suspect rupture whenever you have symptoms and a dilated aortic. So let's talk about image acquisition very quickly. So the thing I want you to remember is, is that you can use a wide variety of probes for this, but it needs to be the low frequency either abdominal probe or the phased array probe that we use for the heart. And that we're going to image the aorta in a cross section. So our transducer is going to be across the body. And the first thing we look for is the spine. We always look for the spine first. So if we identify the spine, we know where the back is. We know how deep we need to look. The aorta rides just above the spine, so if we identify the spine, we should be able to find the aorta. Now, sometimes we get our probe backwards between right and the left and orientation. So the next thing to look for is the liver. If you find the liver, then you know right from left. And if you know that the IVC goes through the liver, you know the other structures, the aorta. Now, the thing that we're most interested in is looking for a dilation in caliber. So really what we need to do is rapidly, relatively rapidly, scan the aorta to see if the size, instead of getting smaller as we go towards the bifurcation, gets bigger. This is a fairly easy process. So we identify the spine, that's the back. We identify the liver, that's the IVC. And now we look at the aorta, and as we sweep down the abdomen, we see that the aorta gets smaller and smaller until it bifurcates into two. And that means that there is no abdominal aortic aneurysm present.
Now we like to make our measurements in three places just for documentation purposes. So we like to make it proximal up near the superior mesenteric artery. This is the most difficult place to image the aorta because there's more bowel gas here and it's further away from the transducer. Then we like to image in the middle part of the aorta, which is below the superior mesenteric artery, which is around where the renal arteries take off from the aorta, and then distally near the bifurcation. Now, of all of these, the distal measurement is the most important because most aneurysms occur in the distal segment of the aorta near the bifurcation. So if you can't image the entire aorta, the distal segment is the most important. Now, you can find aneurysms that extend into the iliac arteries. Those are not aortic aneurysms. Those would be iliac aneurysms, and that's a little bit of a different disease and is managed differently. So I encourage you to look that up and see how they're different. We're going to focus on abdominal aortic aneurysms. Now, how do you measure? Remember when the ultrasound beam comes out of the transducer, it is perpendicular to the face. So we get our best imaging when the beam is perpendicular to the walls of the artery. In other words, the sides of the artery don't see very well. So we always measure anterior, posterior. Now, you will see people measuring side to side on the aorta, and that's fine. Just remember it's a less accurate measurement because we can't see the walls as well. We always see, see the anterior and the posterior wall the best. So this is the most critical measurement. Here's an example of an aortic aneurysm. You can see that there's a nice hypoechoic or black space which looks like blood or looks like a normal artery. It's fairly small in size. But if you look around, you see that there's this less hypoechoic structure, which is the blood that is clotted around this aneurysm. So if you see if you look closely, you can see the wall of the artery is much bigger than the anechoic space where the blood is flowing. So if we were going to measure, we don't want to just focus in on the black space. We want to look for the walls, and we want to measure the entire artery size because in this case, it would be an aneurysm. In this case, it would be an emergency that we need to get this fixed. Now, here we have an example of how to measure. So we start proximally. We measure anterior to posterior, all right? We want to include the walls in our measurement. We're going to slide down until we find the superior mesenteric artery sitting above the aorta, and we're going to take another measurement. Again, this is for documentation purposes. And then we come down to we find the bifurcation where it splits into two. Once we find where it splits into two, we come back proximal, maybe about a centimeter or so, until we have a nice round artery, and we measure again anterior to posterior. Again, the distal segment is the most important segment because this is where most aneurysms occur. Now, what you'll run into frequently is, is that people are obese, and that is certainly a risk factor for the development of a AAA, so those are people we should screen. Remember, distance is our enemy. So it makes it harder to see the artery the more fat we have to look through. Remember also that air is an enemy to ultrasound. Bone, distance, and air are, are, are our enemies. So if we have a lot of bowel gas, it makes it very difficult to see the distal um, aorta or the retroperitoneal aorta. But we can take our transducer and we can push down into the belly. And when we do that, we're putting our transducer closer to the artery, which overcomes the distance problem. And it also helps to push the bowel gas out of the way. So we take our transducer when we can't see that uh, spine and we push down. So here we go. We're going to push down. And when we push down, now we can see the spine posteriorly. And we know that the anechoic or hypoechoic structure, round structure above that is the aorta. And we can make a measurement. Now, the, I always tell you to look for the spine first. The reason is, is because some people confuse the spine as being the aorta, and then you're going to clearly get an inaccurate measurement. You're going to be wrong in your diagnosis. So in this picture, we see that we didn't identify the spine. We measured the spine. The aorta is just above that. 
Now let's look at some aneurysm. So this is a dilation of the artery. You can see that the walls are irregular, but the main thing to pay attention to is that it's dilated. So we have some bowel gas and as we slide, we can see our measurement off to the side and we can just look, measure over and we can see that this aneurysm is well more than six centimeters. So that is an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Here's a little bit different view of that aneurysm. You can see how it's not a perfect circle. That really doesn't matter. What we're looking for is a dilation. So remember, anything bigger than three centimeters is a dilated aorta, and then we need to figure out what we need to do to treat that disease of that aneurysm. Here's another example of a dilated aorta. We see that there is clotted blood, layers of clotted blood, and then we see the blood flowing down near the bottom, the anechoic space. The reason why this is important is, is that people often think of this uh, clotted blood as being the wall of the aorta, and they think that this is a dissection. This is not a dissection, this is an aneurysm because the wall, the whole artery is dilated. The caliber is dilated. And what you're looking at there is not the wall of the artery, but the clotted blood and the layers of clotted blood. Dissections and aneurysms don't generally occur together. It's either one or the other. Dissections have normal caliber. Aortas have dilated caliber. Here it is in long axis. You can see how it can be confused with the walls of the artery because there's layers of clotted blood. But you're not going to get confused with that. You're, if you measured this, this would be well more than three centimeters. That is a dilated aorta. In other words, an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Here's a much larger, easier to see one. The reason why I put this picture in here is, is that I wanted you to remember that the dilation most often occurs near the iliac arteries where it bifurcates. And when you're at that level because of the lordotic curve of the spine, the aorta is closer to the skin, closer to your transducer. So aneurysms are actually easier to find because they're bigger and less distance from your transducer than a normal aorta. So this is a great disease that you can use bedside to try and differentiate between a normal and an abnormal state. Here's a little bit different one showing you some blood flow. You can see the clot is pulsating. This is um, here to remind me to tell you that little bits of this clot can break off and where would they go? They would go distally. So if you see somebody with a blue toe you can think peripheral vascular disease, but don't forget about the aorta. Maybe they have a dilated aorta and they're throwing emboli from that clotted blood from the abnormal flow in the aorta. Here's a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. I told you that you couldn't necessarily see the retroperitoneal blood. Here you can see the blood just outside of the aorta. This is a rare finding because when you see this much blood retroperitoneally, it's a fair amount of blood and remember as the amount of blood increases the volume increases the pressure increases and as the pressure increases on that retroperitoneum the peritoneum itself then it's at risk of rupture also and then you would have a free communication enter into the abdomen and then you would only have seconds to live now quick thing on aortic dissection Abdominal ultrasound can rule in the diagnosis of aortic dissection, but it's not very sensitive. The reason is, is because you're looking for that flap, the intimal wall dissected away from the other two parts of the wall, the media and the adventitia of the artery. And so in dissection, you're looking to find where the blood has gotten between the walls and peeled off that inner wall. As you can imagine, that inner wall is just a small portion of the entire caliber, of the entire wall structure of the artery, so it can be very difficult to see. Now, you can see it on ultrasound. It's just difficult. But let's remember why we're talking about dissection. The reason we're talking about dissection is because we want to differentiate it from an aneurysm. An aneurysm is, has a dilation in its caliber or its diameter. A dissection has normal caliber. A dissection is difficult to diagnose using ultrasound. An aneurysm is easy to diagnose. Here's an example of an aneurysm, uh, 
Here's an example of a dissection. Here we see that the intimal wall of the artery is outlined on the CT by the contrast in the artery. And we can see it very well. When we look on the ultrasound, we see this faint line, which is that intimal wall or a flap inside the normal caliber aorta. You can see how those are exactly the same correlate, but you can see with ultrasound it's more difficult to see than it is on CT. So the preferred method of diagnosing dissection would be a contrasted CT. Here's a little bit um, more uh, zoomed in view. You can see that with the pulsations of the blood flow, we can see that intimal wall moving, which makes it easier to see anytime on ultrasound things are moving. It's easier for your eye to visualize it. Here's another example. We're scanning up. You can see the little intimal flap uh, moving with the blood flow, and it is relatively easy to see, but you can also imagine that it would be relatively easy to miss. Here it is in long axis. You can see that intimal wall, how it is separated from the other two parts of the aortic wall. I hope this helps you understand how ultrasound can be useful in the evaluation and the detection of an aneurysm. Our goal is for you to be able to measure the caliber of the aorta at bedside, and then if it is dilated, then use it in your management, your screening guidelines, to determine what the next steps are, whether the patient needs immediate surgery, whether the patient needs surveillance, whether they don't need anything at all, even though they have an aortic aneurysm. Hope you enjoyed this presentation.